You're listening to Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. I'm Marilyn of Midwest Covencast. Here in Season 3 of Weekend Reads, we will be making our way through the 1922 abridgment of Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough. You can visit MidwestCovencast.com to find podcast extras, including a free online copy of the text. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on Patreon for access to additional materials, like a serialized official Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads ebook with additional notes about the text and some editorial modernizations straight from, well, me. Now, Coven, it is time to cozy up with your coffee or tea and enjoy this episode of Weekend Reads. Chapter 16. Dianus and Diana. In this chapter, I propose to recapitulate the conclusions to which the inquiry has thus far led us, and drawing together the scattered rays of light to turn them on the dark figure of the priest of Nemi. We have found that at an early stage of society, men, ignorant of the secret processes of nature and of the narrow limits within which it is in our power to control and direct them, have commonly arrogated to themselves functions which in the present state of knowledge we should deem superhuman or divine. The illusion has been fostered and maintained by the same causes which begot it, namely the marvelous order and uniformity with which nature conducts her operations." the wheels of her great machine revolving with a smoothness and precision which enable the patient observer to anticipate in general the season if not the very hour when they will bring round the fulfilment of his hopes or the accomplishment of his fears the regularly recurring events of this great cycle or rather series of cycles soon stamp themselves even on the dull mind of the savage he foresees them and foreseeing them mistakes the desired recurrence for an effect of his own will and the dreaded recurrence for an effect of the will of his enemies. Thus, the springs which set the vast machine in motion, though they lie far beyond our ken, shrouded in a mystery which we can never hope to penetrate, appear to ignorant man to lie within his reach. He fancies he can touch them, and so work by magic art all manner of good to himself and evil to his foes. In time, the fallacy of this belief becomes apparent to him. He discovers that there are things he cannot do, pleasures which he is unable of himself to procure, pains which even the most potent magician is powerless to avoid. The unattainable good, the inevitable ill, are now ascribed by him to the action of invisible powers, whose favor is joy and life, whose anger is misery and death." Thus magic tends to be displaced by religion, and the sorcerer by the priest. At this stage of thought, the ultimate causes of things are conceived to be personal beings, many in number and often discordant in character, who partake of the nature and even of the frailty of man, though their might is greater than his, and their life far exceeds the span of his ephemeral existence. Their sharply marked individualities, their clear-cut outlines, have not yet begun, under the powerful solvent of philosophy, to melt and coalesce into that single unknown substratum of phenomena which, according to the qualities with which our imagination invests it, goes by one or other of the high-sounding names which the wit of man has devised to hide his ignorance. Accordingly, so long as men look on their gods as beings akin to themselves and not raised to an unapproachable height above them, they believe it to be possible for those of their own number who surpass their fellows to attain to the divine rank after death or even in life." incarnate human deities of this latter sort may be said to halt midway between the age of magic and the age of religion if they bear the names and display the pomp of deities the powers which they are supposed to wield are commonly those of their predecessor the magician like him they are expected to guard their people against hostile enchantments to heal them in sickness to bless them with offspring and to provide them with an abundant supply of food by regulating the weather and performing the other ceremonies which are deemed necessary to ensure the fertility of the earth and the multiplication of animals men who are credited with powers so lofty and far-reaching naturally hold the highest place in the land and while the rift between the spiritual and the temporal spheres has not yet widened too far they are supreme in civil as well as religious matters in a word they are kings as well as gods thus the divinity which hedges a king has its roots deep down in human history and long ages pass before these are sapped by a profounder view of nature and man 
In the classical period of Greek and Latin antiquity, the reign of kings was for the most part a thing of the past. Yet the stories of their lineage, titles, and pretensions suffice to prove that they too claim to rule by divine right and to exercise superhuman powers. Hence, we may, without undue temerity, assume that the king of the wood at Nemi, though shorn in later times of his glory and fallen on evil days, represented a long line of sacred kings who had once received not only the homage, but the adoration of their subjects in return for the manifold blessings which they were supposed to dispense. What little we know of the functions of Diana and the Eretian Grove seems to prove that she was here conceived as a goddess of fertility, and particularly as a divinity of childbirth. It is reasonable, therefore, to suppose that in the discharge of these important duties, she was assisted by her priest, the two figuring as king and queen of the wood in a solemn marriage, which was intended to make the earth gay with the blossoms of spring and the fruits of autumn, and to gladden the hearts of men and women with healthful offspring. If the priest of Nemi posed not merely as a king, but as a god of the grove, we have still to ask, what deity in particular did he personate? The answer of antiquity is that he represented Verbius, the consort or lover of Diana. But this does not help us much, for of Verbius we know little more than the name. A clue to the mystery is perhaps supplied by the vestal fire which burned in the grove. For the perpetual holy fires of the Arians in Europe appear to have been commonly kindled and fed with oak wood, and in Rome itself, not many miles from Nemi, the fuel of the vestal fire consisted of oaken sticks or logs, as has been proven by microscopic analysis of the charred embers of the vestal fire which were discovered by Commandator G. Boni in the course of the memorable excavations which he conducted in the Roman Forum at the end of the 19th century. But the ritual of the various Latin towns seems to have been marked by great uniformity. Hence, it is reasonable to conclude that wherever in Latium a vestal fire was maintained, it was fed, as at Rome, with wood of the sacred oak. If this was so at Nemi, it becomes probable that the hollowed grove there consisted of a natural oak wood, and that therefore the tree which the king of the wood had to guard at the peril of his life was itself an oak. Indeed, it was from an evergreen oak, according to Virgil, that Aeneas plucked the golden bough. Now the oak was the sacred tree of Jupiter, the supreme god of the Latins. Hence it follows that the king of the wood, whose life was bound up in a fashion with an oak, personated no less a deity than Jupiter himself. At least the evidence, slight as it is, seems to point to this conclusion. The old Alban dynasty of the Silvi, or woods, with their crown of oak leaves, apparently aped the style and emulated the powers of Lady and Jupiter, who dwelt on top of the Alban mountain. It is not impossible that the king of the wood, who guarded the sacred oak a little lower down the mountain, was the lawful successor and representative of this ancient line of the Silvi or woods. At all events, if I am right in supposing that he passed for a human Jupiter, it would appear that Verbius, with whom legend identified him, was nothing but a local form of Jupiter, considered perhaps in his original aspect as a god of the greenwood. The hypothesis that in later times, at all events, the king of the wood played the part of the oak god Jupiter is confirmed by an examination of his divine partner, Diana, for two distinct lines of argument converge to show that Diana was a queen of the woods in general. She was at Nemi a goddess of the oak in particular. In the first place, she bore the title of Vesta, and as such presided over a perpetual fire, which we have seen reason to believe was fed with oak wood. But a goddess of fire is not far removed from the goddess of the fuel, which burns in the fire. Primitive thought, perhaps, drew no sharp line of distinction between the blaze and the wood that blazes. In the second place, the nymph Agiria at Nemi appears to have been merely a form of Diana, and Agiria is definitely said to have been a dryad, a nymph of the oak. Elsewhere in Italy, the goddess had her home on oak-clad mountains. Thus, Mount Algidus, a spur of the Alban hills, was covered in antiquity with dark forests of oak, both of the evergreen and the deciduous sort. In winter, the snow lay long on these cold hills, and their gloomy oak woods were believed to be a favorite haunt of Diana, as they have been of brigands in modern times. Again, Mount Tifida, the long abrupt ridge of the Apennines, which looked down on the Campanian plain behind Capua, was wooded of old with evergreen oaks, among which Diana had a temple. 
Here, Sulla thanked the goddess for his victory over the Marians in the plain below, attesting his gratitude by inscriptions, which were long afterwards to be seen in the temple. On the whole, then, we conclude that at Nemi, the king of the wood personated the oak god Jupiter and mated with the oak goddess Diana in the sacred grove. An echo of their mystic union has come down to us in the legend of the loves of Numa and Egeria, who, according to some, had their trysting place in these holy woods. To this theory, it may naturally be objected that the divine consort of Jupiter was not Diana, but Juno, and that if Diana had a mate at all, he might be expected to bear the name not of Jupiter, but of Dianus or Janus, the latter of these forms being merely a corruption of the former. All this is true, but the objection may be parried by observing that the two pairs of deities, Jupiter and Juno on the one side, and Dianus and Diana, or Janus and Jana on the other side, are merely duplicates of each other, their names and their functions being in substance and origin identical. With regard to their names, all four of them come from the same Aryan root, Di meaning bright, which occurs in the names of the corresponding Greek deities, Zeus and his old female consort, Dion. In regard to their functions, Juno and Diana were both goddesses of fecundity and childbirth, and both were sooner or later identified with the moon. As to the true nature and functions of Janus, the ancients themselves were puzzled, and where they hesitated, it is not for us confidently to decide. But the view mentioned by Varro and Janus was the god of the sky is supported not only by the etymological identity of his name with that of the sky god Jupiter, but also by the relation in which appears to have stood to Jupiter's two mates, Juno and Juturna. For the epithet Junonian bestowed on Janus points to a marriage union between the two deities, and according to one account, Janus was the husband of the water nymph, Juturna, who, according to others, was beloved by Jupiter. Moreover, Janus, like Jove, was regularly invoked and commonly spoken of under the title of father. Indeed, he was identified with Jupiter, not merely by the logic of the learned St. Augustine, but by the piety of a pagan worshipper who dedicated an offering to Jupiter Dianus. A trace of his relation to the oak may be found in the oak woods of the Janiculum, the hill on the right bank of the Tiber, where Janus is said to have reigned as a king in the remotest ages of Italian history. Thus, if I am right, the same ancient pair of deities was variously known among the Greek and Italian peoples as Zeus and Dion, Jupiter and Juno, or Dianus, Janus, and Diana, Jana. The names of the divinities being identical in substance, though varying in form with the dialect of the particular tribe which worshipped them. At first, when the peoples dwelt near each other, the difference between the deities would be hardly more than one of name. In other words, it would be almost purely a dialectical. But the gradual dispersion of the tribes and their consequent isolation from each other would favor the growth of divergent modes of conceiving and worshipping the gods whom they had carried with them from their old home, so that in time discrepancies of myth and ritual would tend to spring up and thereby to convert a nominal into a real distinction between the divinities. Accordingly, when, with the slow progress of culture, the long period of barbarism and separation was passing away, and the rising political power of a single strong community had begun to draw or hammer its weaker neighbors into a nation, the confluent peoples would throw their gods, like their dialects, into a common stock, and thus it might come about that the same ancient deities, which their forefathers had worshipped together before the dispersion, would now be so disguised by the accumulated effect of dialectical and religious divergencies that their original identity might fail to be recognized, and they would take their places side by side as independent divinities in the national pantheon. This duplication of deities, the result of the final fusion of kindred tribes who had long lived apart, would account for the appearance of Janus beside Jupiter, and of Diana or Jana beside Juno in a Roman religion. At least this appears to be a more probable theory than the opinion, which has found favor with some modern scholars, that Janus was originally nothing but the god of doors, that a deity of his dignity and importance, whom the Romans revered as a god of gods and the father of his people, should have started in life as humble, though doubtless respectable, doorkeeper appears very unlikely. So lofty an end hardly consorts with so lowly a beginning. It is more probable that the door, Janua, got its name from Janus, than that he got his name from it. 
This view is strengthened by a consideration of the word Janua itself. The regular word for door is the same in all the language of the Aryan family, from India to Ireland. It is dur in Sanskrit, thura, in Greek, thur, in German, dor, in English, doris, in Old Irish, and forest in Latin. Yet besides this ordinary name for door, which the Latins shared with all their Aryan brethren, they had also the name Genua, to which there is no corresponding term in any Indo-European speech. The word has the appearance of being an adjectival form derived from the noun Janus. I conjecture that it may have been customary to set up an image or symbol of Janus at the principal door of the house in order to place the entrance under the protection of the great god. A door thus guarded might be known as a genua fortis, that is, a genuian door, and the phrase might in time be abridged into genua, the noun forest being understood but not expressed. From this to the use of genua, to designate a door in general, whether guarded by an image of Janus or not, would be an easy and natural transition. If there is any truth in the conjecture, it may explain very simply the origin of the double head of Janus, which has so long exercised the ingenuity of mythologists. When it had become customary to guard the entrance of houses and towns by an image of Janus, it might well be deemed necessary to make the sentinel god look both ways, before and behind, at the same time, in order that nothing should escape his vigilant eye. For if the divine watchman always faced in one direction, it is easy to imagine that mischief might have been wrought with impunity behind his back. This explanation of the double-headed Janus at Rome is confirmed by the double-headed idol, which the bush people in the interior of Suriname regularly set up as a guardian at the entrance of a village. The idol consists of a block of wood with a human face rudely carved on each side. It stands under a gateway composed of two uprights and a crossbar. Beside the idol generally lies a white rag intended to keep off the devil, and sometimes there is also a stick which seems to represent a bludgeon or weapon of some sort. Further, from the crossbar hangs a small log which serves the useful purpose of knocking on the head any evil spirit who might attempt to pass through the gateway. Clearly this double-headed fetish at the gateway of villages in Suriname bears a close resemblance to the double-headed images of Janus, which grasping a stick in one hand and a key in the other, stood sentinel at Roman gates and doorways, and we can hardly doubt that in both cases the heads facing two ways are to be similarly explained as expressive of the vigilance of the guardian god, who kept his eye on spiritual foes behind and before, and stood ready to bludgeon them on the spot. We may therefore dispense with the tedious and unsatisfactory explanations which, if we may trust Ovid, the wily Janus himself, fobbed off an anxious Roman inquirer. To apply these conclusions to the priest of Nemi, we may suppose that as the mate of Diana, he represented originally Dianus or Janus rather than Jupiter, but that the difference between these deities was of old merely superficial going little deeper than the names and leaving practically unaffected the essential functions of the god as a power of the sky, the thunder, and the oak. It was fitting, therefore, that his human representative at Nemi should dwell, as we have seen reason to believe he did, in an oak grove. His title of king of the wood clearly indicates the sylvan character of the deity whom he served, and since he could only be assailed by him who had plucked the bough off a certain tree in the grove, his own life might be said to be bound up with that of the sacred tree. Thus he not only served but embodied the great Aryan god of the oak, and as an oak god he would mate with the oak goddess, whether she went by the name of Agiria or Diana. Their union, however consummated, would be deemed essential to the fertility of the earth and the fecundity of man and beast. Further, as the oak god was also a god of the sky, the thunder, and the rain, so his human representative would be required, like many other divine kings, to cause the clouds to gather, the thunder to peal, and the rain to descend in due season, that the fields and orchards might bear fruit, and the pastures be covered with luxuriant herbage. The reputed possessor of powers, so exalted, must have been a very important personage, and the remains of buildings and votive offerings which have been found on the site of the sanctuary combined with the testimony of classical writers to prove that in later times it was one of the greatest and most popular shrines in Italy. 
Even in the old days, when the Champagne country around was still parceled out among the petty tribes who composed the Latin League, the sacred grove is known to have been an object of their common reverence and care. And just as the kings of Cambodia used to send offerings to the mystic kings of fire and water far in the dim depths of the tropical forest, so we may well believe, from all sides of the broad lady in plain, the eyes and footsteps of Italian pilgrims turned to the quarter where, standing sharply out against the faint blue line of the Apennines, or the deeper blue of the distant sea, the Alban mountain rose before them, the home of the mysterious priest of Nemi, the king of the wood, there among the green woods, and beside the still waters of the lonely hills, the ancient Aryan worship of the god of the oak, the thunder, and the dripping sky lingered in its early, almost druidical form, long after a great political and intellectual revolution had shifted the capital of Latin religion from the forest to the city, from Nemi to Rome. Chapter 17. The Burden of Royalty. Subsection 1. Royal and Priestly Taboos. At a certain stage of early society, the king or priest is often thought to be endowed with supernatural powers or to be an incarnation of a deity, and consistently with this belief, the course of nature is supposed to be more or less under his control, and he is held responsible for bad weather, failure of the crops, and similar calamities. To some extent, it appears to be assumed that the king's power over nature, like that over his subjects and slaves, is exerted through definite acts of will, and therefore, if drought, famine, pestilence, or storms arise, the people attribute the misfortune to the negligence or guilt of their king, and punish him accordingly with stripes and bonds, or, if he remains obdurate, with deposition and death. Sometimes, however, the course of nature, while regarded as dependent on the king, is supposed to be partly independent of his will. His person is considered, if we may express it so, as the dynamical center of the universe, from which lines of force radiate to all quarters of the heaven, so that any motion of his, the turning of his head, the lifting of his hand, instantaneously affects and may seriously disturb some part of nature." He is the point of support on which hangs the balance of the world, and the slightest irregularity on his part may overthrow the delicate equipose. The greatest care must therefore be taken both by and of him, and his whole life, down to its minutest details, must be so regulated that no act of his, voluntary or involuntary, may disarrange or upset the established order of nature. Of this class of monarchs, the Mikado, or Deari, the spiritual emperor of Japan, is, or rather used to be, a typical example. He is an incarnation of the sun goddess, the deity who rules the universe, gods and men included. Once a year, all the gods wait upon him and spent a month at his court. During that month, the name of which means without gods, no one frequents the temples, for they are believed to be deserted. The Mikado receives from his people and assumes in his official proclamations and decrees the title of manifest or incarnate deity, and he claims a general authority over the gods of Japan. For example, in an official decree of the year 646, the emperor is described as the incarnate god who governs the universe. The following description of the Mikado's mode of life was written about 200 years ago. Even to this day, the princes descended of this family, more particularly those who sit on the throne, are looked upon as persons most holy in themselves, and as popes by birth, and in order to preserve these advantageous notions in the minds of their subjects, they are obliged to take an uncommon care of their sacred persons, and to do such things which, examined according to the customs of other nations, would be thought ridiculous and impertinent. It will not be improper to give a few instances of it. He thinks that it would be very prejudicial to his dignity and holiness to touch the ground with his feet. For this reason, when he intends to go anywhere, he must be carried thither on men's shoulders. Much less will they suffer that he should expose his sacred person to the open air, and the sun is not thought worthy to shine on his head. There is such a holiness ascribed to all the parts of his body that he dares to cut off neither his hair, nor his beard, nor his nails. However, lest he should grow too dirty, they may clean him in the night when he is asleep." because, they say, that which is taken from his body at that time hath been stolen from him, and that such a theft doth not prejudice his holiness or dignity. In ancient times he was obliged to sit on the throne for some hours every morning, with the imperial crown on his head, 
but to sit altogether like a statue, without stirring either hands or feet, head or eyes, nor indeed any part of his body, because by this means it was thought that he could preserve peace and tranquillity in his empire. For if, unfortunately, he turned himself on one side or the other, or if he looked a good while towards any part of his dominions, it was apprehended that war, famine, fire, or some other great misfortune was near at hand to desolate the country. But it having been afterwards discovered that the imperial crown was the palladium, which by its immobility could preserve peace in the empire, it was thought expedient to deliver his imperial person, consecrated only to idleness and pleasures, from this burdensome duty. And therefore the crown is at present placed on the throne for some hours every morning." his victuals must be dressed every time in new pots and served at table in new dishes both are very clean and neat but made only of common clay that without any considerable expense they may be laid aside or broke after they have served once they are generally broke for fear they should come into the hands of laymen for they believe religiously that if any layman should presume to eat his food out of these sacred dishes it would swell and inflame his mouth and throat. The like ill effect is dreaded from the Deiri's sacred habits. For they believe that if a layman should wear them without the emperor's express leave or command, they would occasion swellings and pains in all parts of his body. To the same effect, an earlier account of the Mikado says, it was considered as a shameful degradation for him even to touch the ground with his foot. The sun and moon were not even permitted to shine upon his head. None of the superfluities of the body were ever taken from him. Neither his hair, his beard, nor his nails were cut. Whatever he eat was dressed in new vessels. Similar priestly or rather divine kings are found at a lower level of barbarism on the west coast of Africa. At Shark Point, near Cape Padrone in Lower Guinea, lives the priestly king Kukulu, alone in a wood. He may not touch a woman nor leave his house. Indeed, he may not even quit his chair, in which he is obliged to sleep sitting. For if he lay down, no wind would arise and navigation would be stopped. He regulates storms and in general maintains a wholesome and equable state of the atmosphere. On Mount Egu in Togo, there lives a fetish or spirit called Bagba who is of great importance for the whole of the surrounding country. The power of giving or withholding rain is ascribed to him, and he is lord of the winds, including the harmattan, the dry, hot wind which blows from the interior. His priest dwells in a house on the highest peak of the mountain, where he keeps the winds bottled up in huge jars. Applications for rain, too, are made to him, and he does a good business in amulets, which consist of the teeth and claws of leopards. Yet, though his power is great, and he is indeed the real chief of the land, the rule of the fetish forbids him ever to leave the mountain, and he must spend the whole of his life on its summit. Only once a year may he come down to make purchases in the market, but even then he may not set foot in the hut of any mortal man, and must return to his place of exile the same day. The business of government in the villages is conducted by subordinate chiefs, who are appointed by him. In the West African kingdom of Congo, there was a supreme pontiff called Chitome, or Chitombe, whom the people regarded as a god on earth and all-powerful in heaven. Hence, before they would taste the new crops, they offered him the first fruits, fearing that manifold misfortune would befall them if they broke this rule. When he left his residence to visit other places within his jurisdiction, all married people had to observe strict continence the whole time he was out. For it was supposed that any act of incontinence would prove fatal to him. And if he were to die a natural death, they thought that the world would perish, and the earth, which he alone sustained by his power and merit, would immediately be annihilated. Amongst the semi-barbarous nations of the New World, at the date of the Spanish conquest, there were found hierarchies or theocracies like those of Japan. In particular, the high pontiff of the Zapotecs appears to have presented a close parallel to the Mikado. A powerful rival to the king himself, this spiritual lord governed Yopa, one of the chief cities of the kingdom, with absolute dominion. It is impossible, we are told, to overrate the reverence in which he was held. He was looked on as a god whom the earth was not worthy to hold, nor the sun to shine upon. He profaned his sanctity if he even touched the ground with his foot. The officers who bore his palanquin on their shoulders were members of the highest families. He hardly deigned to look on anything around him, and all who met him fell with their faces to the earth, fearing that death would overtake them if they saw even his shadow. 
A rule of continence was regularly imposed on the Zapotec priests, especially upon the high pontiff, but on certain days in each year, which were generally celebrated with feasts and dances, it was customary for the high priest to become drunk. While in the state, seeming to belong neither to heaven nor to earth, one of the most beautiful of the virgins consecrated to the service of the gods was brought to him. If the child she bore him was a son, he was brought up as a prince of the blood, and the eldest son succeeded his father on the pontifical throne. The supernatural powers attributed to this pontiff are not specified, but probably they resembled those of the Mikado or the Chitome. Wherever, as in Japan and West Africa, it is supposed that the order of nature, and even the existence of the world, is bound up with the life of the king or priest, it is clear that he must be regarded by his subjects as a source both of infinite blessings and of infinite danger. On the one hand, the people have to thank him for the rain and sunshine, which foster the fruits of the earth, for the wind which brings ships to their coasts, and even for the solid ground beneath their feet. But what he gives he can refuse, and so close is the dependence of nature on his person, so delicate the balance of the system of forces whereof he is the center, that the least irregularity on his part may set up a tremor which shall shake the earth to its foundations. And if nature may be disturbed by the slightest involuntary act of the king, it is easy to conceive the convulsion which his death might provoke. The natural death of the Chitome, as we have seen, was thought to entail the destruction of all things. Clearly, therefore, out of a regard for their own safety, which might be imperiled by any rash act of the king, and still more by his death, the people will exact of their king or priest a strict conformity to those rules. The observance of which is deemed necessary for his own preservation, and consequently for the preservation of his people and the world. The idea that early kingdoms are despotisms, in which the people exist only for the sovereign, is wholly inapplicable to the monarchies we are considering. On the contrary, the sovereign in them exists only for his subjects. His life is only valuable so long as he discharges the duties of his position by ordering the course of nature for his people's benefit. So soon as he fails to do so, the care, the devotion, the religious homage which they had hitherto lavished on him cease and are changed into hatred and contempt. He is dismissed ignominiously and may be thankful if he escapes with his life. Worshipped as a god one day, he is killed as a criminal the next. But in this charged behavior of the people, there is nothing capricious or inconsistent. On the contrary, their conduct is entirely of peace. If their king is their god, he is or should be also their preserver, and if he will not preserve them, he must make room for another who will. So long, however, as he answers their expectations, there is no limit to the care which they take of him, and which they compel him to take of himself. A king of this sort lives hedged in by a ceremonious etiquette, a network of prohibitions and observances, of which the intention is not to contribute to his dignity, much less to his comfort, but to restrain him from conduct which, by disturbing the harmony of nature, might involve himself, his people, and the universe in one common catastrophe. Far from adding to his comfort, these observances, by trammeling his every act, annihilate his freedom, and often render the very life, which is their object to preserve, a burden and sorrow to him. Of the supernaturally endowed kings of Luongo, it is said that the more powerful a king is, the more taboos is he bound to observe. They regulate all his actions, his walking and his standing, his eating and drinking, his sleeping and waking. To these restraints, the heir to the throne is subject from infancy. But as he advances in life, the number of abstinences and ceremonies which he must observe increases, until at the moment that he ascends the throne, he is lost in the ocean of rites and taboos. In the crater of an extinct volcano, enclosed on all sides by grassy slopes, lie the scattered huts and yam fields of Riaba, the capital of the native king of Fernando Po. This mysterious being lives in the lowest depths of the crater, surrounded by a harem of forty women, and covered, it is said, with old silver coins. Naked savage as he is, he yet exercises far more influence in the island than the Spanish governor at Santa Isabel. In him, the conservative spirit of the Bobies, or aboriginal inhabitants of the island, is, as it were, incorporate. He has never seen a white man, and, according to the firm conviction of all the Bobies, the sight of a pale face would cause his instant death. 
he cannot bear to look upon the sea. Indeed, it is said that he may never see it even in the distance, and that therefore he wears away his life with shackles on his legs in the dim twilight of his hut. Certain it is that he has never set foot on the beach. With the exception of his musket and knife, he uses nothing that comes from the whites. European cloth never touches his person, and he scorns tobacco, rum, and even salt. Among the you-speaking people of the slave coast, the king is at the same time high priest. In this quality, he was, particularly in former times, unapproachable by his subjects. Only by night was he allowed to quit his dwelling in order to bathe and so forth. None but his representative, the so-called visible king, with three chosen elders, might converse with him, and even they had to sit on an oxhide, with their backs turned to him. He might not see any European, nor any horse, nor might he look upon the sea, for which reason he was not allowed to quit his capital even for a few moments. These rules have been disregarded in recent times. The king of Dahomey himself is subject to the prohibition of beholding the sea, and so are the kings of Luango and Great Andra in New Guinea. The sea is the fetish of the Aeos, to the northwest of Dahomey and they and their king are threatened with death by their priests if ever they dare to look on it. It is believed that the king of Kaior and Senegal would infallibly die within the year if he were to cross a river or an arm of the sea. In Mashonaland, down to recent times, the chiefs would not cross certain rivers, particularly the Ruroqui and the Nyadiri, and the custom was still strictly observed by at least one chief within recent years. On no account would the chief cross the river. If it is absolutely necessary for him to do so, he is blindfolded and carried across with shouting and singing. Should he walk across, he will go blind or die and certainly lose the chieftainship. So among the Mahaflis and the Sakalavas in the south of Madagascar, some kings are forbidden to sail on the sea or to cross certain rivers. Among the Sakalavas, the chief is regarded as a sacred being, but he is held in leash by a crowd of restrictions, which regulate his behavior like that of the emperor of China. He can undertake nothing whatever unless the sorcerers have declared the omens favorable. He may not eat warm food, on certain days he may not quit his hut, and so on. Among some of the hill tribes of Assam, both the headman and his wife have to observe many taboos in respect of food. Thus, they may not eat buffalo, pork, dog, fowl, or tomatoes. The headman must be chaste, the husband of one wife, and he must separate himself from her on the eve of a general or public observance of taboo. In one group of tribes, the headman is forbidden to eat in a strange village, and under no provocation, whatever, may he utter a word of abuse. Apparently, the people imagine that the violation of any of these taboos by a headman would bring down misfortune on the whole village. The ancient kings of Ireland, as well as the kings of the four provinces of Leinster, Munster, Conant, and Ulster, were subject to certain quaint prohibitions or taboos, on the due observance of which the prosperity of the people of the country, as well as their own, was supposed to depend. Thus, for example, the sun might not rise on the king of Ireland in his bed at Tara, the old capital of Erin. He was forbidden to alight on Wednesday at Mabra, to traverse Maquilin after sunset, to incite his horse at Fancomer, to go in a ship upon the water the Monday after Beltane, May Day, and to leave the track of his army upon Athmena, the Tuesday after All Hallows. The king of Leinster might not go round Twathlehain left hand wise on Wednesday, nor sleep between the Dother, daughter, and the Dublin, with his head inclining to one side, nor encamp for nine days on the plains of Qualon, nor travel the road of Dublin on Monday, nor ride a dirty black-heeled horse across Magmastein. The king of Munster was prohibited from enjoying the feast of Lochlane from one Monday to another, from banqueting by night in the beginning of harvest before Gaim at Lytreka, from encamping for nine days upon the Seer, and from holding a border meeting at Gabron. The king of Connet might not conclude a treaty respecting his ancient palace of Kruakun after making peace on All Hallows' Day, nor go in a speckled garment on a gray speckled steed to the heath of Dalkais nor repair to an assembly of women at Sagace, nor sit in autumn on the sepulchre mounds of the wife of Maine, nor contend in running with the rider of a grey one-eyed horse at Athgalta between two posts. 
the king of Ulster was forbidden to attend the horse fair at Rathline, among the use of Dal Allarday, to listen to the fluttering of the flocks of birds of Lynn Salic after sunset, to celebrate the feast of the bull of Der Mikder, to go into Magcoba in the month of March, or to drink of the water of Bo Nemedy between two darknesses. If the kings of Ireland strictly observed these and many other customs, which were enjoined by immemorial usage, it was believed that they would never meet with mischance or misfortune, and would live for ninety years without experiencing the decay of old age, that no epidemic or mortality would occur during their reigns, and that the seasons would be favorable, and the earth yield its fruit in abundance. Whereas, if they set the ancient usages at naught, the country would be visited with plague, famine, and bad weather." The kings of Egypt were worshipped as gods, and the routine of their daily life was regulated in every detail by precise and unvarying rules. The life of the kings of Egypt, says Diodorus, was not like that of other monarchs, who are irresponsible and may do just what they choose. On the contrary, everything was fixed for them by law, not only their official duties, but even the details of their daily life. The hours, both of day and night, were arranged at which the king had to do, not what he pleased, but what was prescribed for him. For not only were the times appointed at which he should transact public business or sit in judgment, but the very hours of his walking and bathing and sleeping with his wife, and, in short, performing every act of life, were all settled. Custom enjoined a simple diet. The only flesh he might eat was veal and goose, and he might only drink a prescribed quantity of wine. However, there is reason to think that these rules were observed not by the ancient pharaohs, but by the priestly kings who reigned at Thebes and Ethiopia at the close of the 20th dynasty. On the taboos imposed on priests, we may see a striking example in the rules of life prescribed for the Flamen Dialis at Rome, who has been interpreted as a living image of Jupiter, or a human embodiment of the sky spirit. They were such as the following. The Flamen Dialis might not ride or even touch a horse, nor see an army under arms, nor wear a ring which was not broken, nor have a knot on any part of his garments. No fire, except a sacred fire, might be taken out of his house." He might not touch wheat and flour, or leave in bread. He might not touch or even game a goat, a dog, raw meat, beans, and ivy. He might not walk under a vine. The feet of his bed had to be daubed with mud. His hair could be cut only by a free man, and with a bronze knife, and his hair nails, when cut, had to be buried under a lucky tree. He might not touch a dead body, nor enter a place where one has burned. He might not see work being done on holy days. He might not be uncovered in the open air. If a man in bonds were taken into his house, the captive had to be unbounded, and the cords had to be drawn up through a hole in the roof, and so let down into the street. His wife, the Flaminica, had to observe nearly the same rules, and others of her own besides. She might not ascend more than three steps of the kind of staircase called Greek at a certain festival. She might not comb her hair. The leather of her shoes might not be made from a beast that had died a natural death, but only from one that had been slain or sacrificed. If she heard thunder, she was tabooed till she had offered an expiatory sacrifice." Among the Grebo people of Sierra Leone, there is a pontiff who bears the title of Bodia, and has been compared, on somewhat slender grounds, to the high priest of the Jews. He is appointed in accordance with the behest of an oracle. At an elaborate ceremony of installation, he is anointed, a ring is put on his ankle as a badge of office, and the doorposts of his house are sprinkled with the blood of a sacrificed goat." He has charge of the public talismans and idols, which he feeds with rice and oil every new moon, and he sacrifices on behalf of the town to the dead and to demons. Nominally, his power is very great, but in practice it is very limited, for he dare not defy public opinion, and he is held responsible, even with his life, for any adversity that befalls the country." It is expected of him that he should cause the earth to bring forth abundantly, the people to be healthy, war to be driven far away, and witchcraft to be kept in abeyance. His life is trammeled by the observance of certain restrictions or taboos. Thus, he may not sleep in any house but his own official residence, which is called the anointed house, with reference to the ceremony of anointing him at inauguration." He may not drink water on the highway, he may not eat while a corpse is in the town, and he may not mourn for the dead. 
If he dies while in office, he must be buried at dead of night. Few may hear of his burial, and none may mourn for him when his death is made public. Should he have fallen a victim to the poison ordeal by drinking a decoction of sassy wood, as it is called, he must be buried under a running stream of water. Among the Todas of southern India, the holy milkman, who acts as priest of the sacred dairy, is subject to a variety of irksome and burdensome restrictions during the whole time of his incumbency, which may last many years. Thus he must live at the sacred dairy and may never visit his home or any ordinary village. He must be celibate. If he is married, he must leave his wife. On no account may any ordinary person touch the holy milkman or the holy dairy. Such a touch would so defile his holiness that he would forfeit his office. It is only on two days a week, namely Mondays and Thursdays, that a mere layman may even approach the milkman. On other days, if he has any business with him, he must stand at a distance, some say a quarter of a mile, and shout his message across the intervening space. Further, the holy milkman never cuts his hair or pairs his nails so long as he holds office. He never crosses a river by a bridge, but wades through a ford, and only certain fords. If a death occurs in his clan, he may not attend any of the funeral ceremonies, unless he first resigns his office and descends from the exalted rank of milkman to that of a mere common mortal. Indeed, it appears that in old days he had to resign the seals, or rather the pails, of office whenever any member of his clan departed his life. However, these heavy restraints are laid, in their entirety, only on milkmen of the very highest class. Subsection 2. Divorce of the Spiritual from the Temporal Power the burdensome observances attached to the royal or priestly office produce their natural effect— Either men refused to accept the office, which hence tended to fall into abeyance, or accepting it, they sank under its weight into spiritless creatures, cloistered recluses, from whose nerveless fingers the reins of government slipped into the firmer grasp of men who were often content to wield the reality of sovereignty without its name. In some countries, this rift in the supreme power deepened into a total and permanent separation of the spiritual and temporal powers the old royal house retaining their purely religious functions, while the civil government passed into the hands of a younger and more vigorous race. To take examples, in a previous part of this work, we saw that in Cambodia it is often necessary to force the kingships of fire and water upon the reluctant successors, and that in Savage Island the monarchy actually came to an end because at last no one could be induced to accept the dangerous distinction. In some parts of West Africa, when the king dies, a family council is secretly held to determine his successor. He on whom the choice falls is suddenly seized, bound, and thrown into the fetish house, where he is kept in durance, till he consents to accept the crown. Sometimes the heir finds means of evading the honor, which it is sought to thrust upon him. A ferocious chief has been known to go about constantly armed, resolute to resist by force any attempt to set him on the throne. The savage Tims of Sierra Leone, who elect their king, reserve to themselves the right of beating him on the eve of his coronation, and they avail themselves of this constitutional privilege with such hearty goodwill that sometimes the unhappy monarch does not long survive his elevation to the throne. Hence, when the leading chiefs have a spite at a man and wish to rid themselves of him, they elect him king. Formerly, before a man was proclaimed king of Sierra Leone, it used to be the custom to load him with chains and thrash him. Then the fetters were knocked off, the kingly robe was placed on him, and he received in his hands the symbol of royal dignity, which was nothing but the axe of the executioner. It is not, therefore, surprising to read that in Sierra Leone, where such customs have prevailed, except among the Mandingos and Susies, Few kings are natives of the countries they govern. So different are their ideas from ours that very few are solicitous of the honor, and competition is very seldom heard of. The Mikados of Japan seem early to have resorted to the expedient of transferring the honors and burdens of supreme power to their infant children, and the rise of the tycoons long the temporal sovereigns of the country is traced to the abdication of a certain Mikado in favor of his three-year-old son. 
The sovereignty having been arrested by a usurper from the infant prince, the cause of the Mikado was championed by Yoritomo, a man of spirit and conduct, who overthrew the usurper and restored to the Mikado the shadow. While he retained for himself the substance of power, he bequeathed to his descendants the dignity he had won, and thus became the founder of the line of tycoons. Down to the latter half of the 16th century, the tycoons were active and efficient rulers, but the same fate overtook them, which had befallen the Mikados. Enmeshed in the same inextricable web of custom and law, they degenerated into mere puppets, hardly stirring from their palaces, and occupied in a perpetual round of empty ceremonies, while the real business of government was managed by the Council of State. In Tonquin, the monarchy ran a similar course. Living like his predecessors in effeminacy and sloth, the king was driven from the throne by an ambitious adventurer named Mac, who, from a fisherman, had risen to be Grand Mandarin. But the king's brother, Tring, put down the usurper and restored the king, retaining, however, for himself and his descendants the dignity of general of all the forces. Thenceforth the kings, though invested with the title and pomp of sovereignty, ceased to govern. While they lived secluded in their palaces, all real political power was wielded by the hereditary generals. In Mangaya, a Polynesian island, religious and civil authority were lodged in separate hands, spiritual functions being discharged by a line of hereditary kings, while the temporal government was entrusted from time to time to a victorious war chief, whose investiture, however, had to be completed by the king. Similarly, in Tonga, besides the civil king, whose right to the throne was partly hereditary and partly derived from his warlike reputation and the number of his fighting men, there was a great divine chief who ranked above the king and the other chiefs in virtue of his supposed descent from one of the chief gods. Once a year, the first fruits of the ground were offered to him at a solemn ceremony, and it was believed that if these offerings were not made, the vengeance of the gods would fall in a signal manner on the people. Peculiar forms of speech, such as were applied to no one else, were used in speaking of him, and everything that he chanced to touch became sacred or tabooed. When he and the king met, the monarch had to sit down on the ground in token of respect until his holiness had passed by. Yet though he enjoyed the highest veneration by reason of his divine origin, this sacred personage possessed no political authority, and if he ventured to meddle with affairs of state, it was at the risk of receiving a rebuff from the king, to whom the real power belonged, and who finally succeeded in ridding himself of his spiritual rival. In some parts of Western Africa, two kings reigned side by side, a fetish or religious king and a civil king, but the fetish king is really supreme. He controls the weather, and so forth, and can put a stop to everything. When he lays his red staff on the ground, no one may pass that way. This division of power between a sacred and secular ruler is to be met with whenever the true African culture has been left unmolested, but where the African form of society has been disturbed, as in Dahomey and Ashante, there is a tendency to consolidate the two powers in a single king. In some parts of the East Indian island of Timor, we meet with a partition of power like that which is represented by the civil king and the fetish king of Western Africa. Some of the Timorese tribes recognize two rajas, the ordinary or civil raja, one governs the people, and the fetish or taboo raja, who is charged with the control of everything that concerns the earth and its products. This latter ruler has the right of declaring anything taboo. His permission must be obtained before new land may be brought under cultivation, and he must perform certain necessary ceremonies when the work is being carried out. If drought or blight threatens the crops, his help is invoked to save them. Though he ranks below the civil Raja, he exercises a momentous influence on the course of events, for his secular colleague is bound to consult him in all important matters. In some of the neighboring islands, such as Roti and Eastern Flores, a spiritual ruler of the same sort is recognized under various native names, which all mean Lord of the Ground. Similarly, in the Mikio district of British New Guinea, there is a double chieftainship, the people are divided into two groups according to families, and each of the groups has its chief. One of the two is the war chief, the other is the taboo chief. The office of the latter is hereditary. His duty is to impose a taboo on any of the crops, such as the coconuts and the areca nuts, whenever he thinks it desirable to prohibit their use. 
In his office, we may perhaps detect the beginning of a priestly dynasty, but as yet his functions appear to be more magical than religious, being concerned with the control of the harvests rather than with the appropriation of higher powers. Chapter 18. The Perils of the Soul. Subsection 1. The Soul as a Mannequin. The foregoing examples have taught us that the office of a sacred king or priest is often hedged in by a series of burdensome restrictions or taboos, of which a principal purpose appears to be to preserve the life of the divine man for the good of his people. But if the object of the taboos is to save his life, the question arises, how is their observance supposed to affect this end? To understand this, we must know the nature of the danger which threatens the king's life, and which it is the intention of these curious restrictions to guard against. We must therefore ask, what does early man understand by death? To what cause does he attribute it? And how does he think it may be guarded against? As the savage commonly explains, the process of inanimate nature, by supposing that they are produced by living beings, working in or behind the phenomena, so he explains the phenomena of life itself. If an animal lives and moves, it can only be, he thinks, because there is a little animal inside which moves it. If a man lives and moves, it can only be because he has a little man or animal inside who moves him. The animal inside the animal, the man inside the man, is the soul. And as the activity of an animal or man is explained by the presence of the soul, so the repose of sleep or death is explained by its absence, sleep or trance being the temporary, death being the permanent absence of the soul. Hence, if death be the permanent absence of the soul, the way to guard against it is either to prevent the soul from leaving the body, or, if it does depart, to ensure that it shall return. The precautions adopted by savages to secure one or other of these ends take the form of certain prohibitions or taboos, which are nothing but rules intended to ensure either the continued presence or the return of the soul. In short, they are life preservers or lifeguards. These general statements will now be illustrated by examples. Addressing some Australian blacks, a European missionary said, I am not one, as you think, but two. Upon they laughed. You may laugh as much as you like, continued the missionary. I tell you that I am two in one. This great body that you see is one. Within that there is another little one, which is not visible. The great body dies and is buried, but the little body flies away when the great one dies. To this, some of the blacks replied, Yes, yes, we also are two. We also have a little body within the breast. On being asked where the little body went after death, some said it went behind the bush, others said it went into the sea, and some said they did not know. The Hurons thought that the soul had a head and body, arms and legs, in short, that it was a complete little model of the man himself. The Eskimo believed that the soul exhibits the same shape as the body it belongs to, but is of a more subtle and ethereal nature. According to the Nutkus, the soul has the shape of a tiny man. Its seat is the crown of the head. So long as it stands erect, its owner is hale and hearty. But when from any cause it loses its upright position, he loses his senses. Among the Indian tribes of the lower Fraser River, man is held to have four souls, of which the principal one has the form of a mannequin, while the other three are shadows of it. The Malays conceive the human soul as a little man, mostly invisible and of the bigness of a thumb, who corresponds exactly in shape, proportion, and even in complexion to the man in whose body he resides. The mannequin is of a thin, unsubstantial nature, though not so impalpable but that it may cause displacement on entering a physical object, and it can flit quickly from place to place. It is temporarily absent from the body in sleep, trance, and disease, and permanently absent after death. So exact is this resemblance of the mannequin to the man, in other words, of the soul to the body, that, as there are fat bodies and thin bodies, so there are fat souls and thin souls, as there are heavy bodies and light bodies, long bodies and short bodies, so there are heavy souls and light souls, long souls and short souls. The people of Nice think that every man, before he is born, is asked how long or how heavy a soul he would like, and a soul of the desired weight or length is measured out to him. The heaviest soul ever given outweighs about ten grams. The length of a man's life is proportional to the length of his soul. Children who die young had short souls. The Fijian conception of the soul as a tiny human being comes clearly out in the customs observed at the death of a chief among the Nikello tribe 
when a chief dies, certain men who are the hereditary undertakers call him, as he lies, oiled and ornamented, on fine mats, saying, Rise, sir, the chief, and let us be going. The day has come over the land. Then they conduct him to the riverside, where the ghostly ferryman comes to ferry Nikello ghosts across the stream. As they thus attend the chief on his last journey, they hold their great fans close to the ground to shelter him, because, as one of them explained to a missionary, his soul is only a little child. People in the Punjab, who tattoo themselves, believe that at death, the soul, the little entire man or woman inside the mortal frame, will go to heaven blazoned with the same tattoo patterns which adorn the body in life. Sometimes, however, as we shall see, the human soul is conceived not in human, but in animal form. Subsection 2. Absence and Recall of the Soul The soul is commonly supposed to escape by the natural openings of the body, especially the mouth and nostrils. Hence, in celibus, they sometimes fasten fish hooks to a sick man's nose, navel, and feet, so that if his soul should try to escape, it may be hooked and held fast. A Turek on the Baram River in Borneo refused to part with some hook-like stones because they, as it were, hooked his soul to his body and so prevented the spiritual portion of him from becoming detached from the material. When a sea dyak sorcerer or medicine man is initiated, his fingers are supposed to be furnished with fish hooks, with which he will thereafter clutch the human soul in the act of flying away and restore it to the body of the sufferer. But hooks, it is plain, may be used to catch the souls of enemies as well as of friends. Acting on this principle, headhunters in Borneo hang wooden hooks beside the skulls of their slain enemies in the belief that this helps them on their forays to hook in fresh heads. One of the implements of a Haida medicine man is a hollow bone in which he bottles up departing souls and so restores them to their owners. When any one yawns in their presence, the Hindus always snap their thumbs, believing that this will hinder the soul from issuing through the open mouth. The Marquesans used to hold the mouth and nose of a dying man in order to keep him in life by preventing his soul from escaping. The same custom is reported of the New Caledonians, and with the like intentions, the Bogobos of the Philippine Islands put rings of brass wire on the wrists or ankles of their sick. On the other hand, the autonomous of South America seal up the eyes, nose, and mouth of a dying person, in case his ghost should get out and carry off others, and for a similar reason, the people of Nias, who fear the spirits of the recently deceased and identify them with the breath, seek to confine the vagrant soul in its earthly tabernacle by bunging up the nose or tying up the jaws of the corpse." Before leaving a corpse, the Wackleborough of Australia used to place hot coals in its ears in order to keep the ghost in the body until they had got such a good start that he could not overtake them. In southern celibus, to hinder the escape of a woman's soul in childbed, the nurse ties a band as tightly as possible round the body of the expectant mother. The Menanka Bowers of Sumatra observe a similar custom. A skein of thread or a string is sometimes fastened round the wrist or loins of a woman in childbed, so that when her soul seeks to depart in her hour of travail, it may find the egress barred. And lest the soul of a babe should escape and be lost as soon as it is born, the alfors of celibus, when a birth is about to take place, are careful to close every opening in the house, even the keyhole, and they stop up every chink and cranny in the walls. Also, they tie up the mouths of all animals inside and outside the house, for fear one of them might swallow the child's soul. For a similar reason, all persons present in the house, even the mother herself, are obliged to keep their mouths shut the whole time the birth is taking place. When the question was put, why they did not hold their noses also, lest the child's soul should get into one of them, the answer was the breath being exhaled as well as inhaled through the nostrils, the soul would be expelled before it could have time to settle down. Popular expressions in the language of civilized peoples, such as to have one's heart in one's mouth, or the soul on the lips, or in the nose, show how natural is the idea that the life or soul may escape by the mouth or nostrils. Often the soul is conceived as a bird ready to take flight. This conception has probably left traces in most languages, and it lingers as a metaphor in poetry. The Malays carry out the conception of the bird's soul in a number of odd ways. If the soul is a bird on the wing, it may be attracted by rice, and so either prevented from flying away or lured back again from its perilous flight. 
Thus, in Java, when a child is placed on the ground for the first time, a moment which uncultured people seem to regard as especially dangerous, it is put in a hen coop, and the mother makes a clucking sound, as if she were calling hens. And in Sintang, a district of Borneo, when a person, whether man or woman or child, has fallen out of a house or off a tree and has been brought home, his wife or other kinswoman goes as speedily as possible to the spot where the accident happened and there strews rice, which has been colored yellow, while she utters the words, cluck, cluck, soul, so-and-so is in the house again, cluck, cluck, soul. Then she gathers up the rice in a basket, carries it to the sufferer, and drops the grains from her hand on his head, saying, cluck, cluck, soul. Here the intention clearly is to decoy back the loitering bird soul and replace it in the head of its owner. The soul of a sleeper is supposed to wander away from his body and actually to visit the places, to see the persons and to perform the acts of which he dreams. For example, when an Indian of Brazil or Guinea wakes up from a sound sleep, he is firmly convinced that his soul has really been away hunting, fishing, felling trees, or whatever else he has dreamed of doing, while all the time his body has been lying motionless in his hammock. A whole Bororo village has been thrown into a panic and nearly deserted because somebody had dreamed that he saw enemies stealthily approaching it. A Makuzi Indian, in weak health, who dreamed that his employer had made him haul the canoe up a series of difficult cataracts, bitterly reproached his master next morning for his want of consideration in thus making a poor invalid go out and toil during the night. The Indians of the Grand Chaco are often heard to relate the most incredible stories, as things which they have themselves seen and heard. Hence strangers who do not know them intimately say in their haste that these Indians are liars." In point of fact, the Indians are firmly convinced of the truth of what they relate, for these wonderful adventures are simply their dreams, which they do not distinguish from waking realities. Now the absence of the soul in sleep has its dangers, for if from any cause the soul should be permanently detained away from the body, the person thus deprived of the vital principle must die. There is a German belief that the soul escapes from the sleeper's mouth in the form of a white mouse or a little bird and that to prevent the return of the bird or animal would be fatal to the sleeper. Hence in Transylvania, they say that you should not let a child sleep with its mouth open, or its soul will slip out in the shape of a mouse, and the child will never wake. Many causes may detain the sleeper's soul. Thus, his soul may meet the soul of another sleeper, and the two souls may fight. If a guinea individual wakens with sore bones in the morning, he thinks that his soul has been thrashing by another soul in sleep, or it may meet the soul of a person just deceased and be carried off by it. Hence, in the Aru Islands, the inmates of a house will not sleep the night after a death has taken place in it, because the soul of the deceased is supposed to be still in the house, and they fear to meet it in a dream. Again, the soul of the sleeper may be prevented by an accident or by physical force from returning to his body. When a Dayak dreams of falling into the water, he supposes that this accident has really befallen his spirit, and he sends for a wizard who fishes for the spirit with a hand net in a basin of water till he catches it and restores it to its owner. The Santals tell how a man fell asleep, and growing very thirsty, his soul, in the form of a lizard, left his body and entered a pitcher of water to drink. Just then, the owner of the pitcher happened to cover it, so the soul could not return to the body, and the man died. While his friends were preparing to burn the body, someone uncovered the pitcher to get water. The lizard thus escaped and returned to the body, which immediately revived. So the man rose up and asked his friends why they were weeping. They told him they thought he was dead and were about to burn his body. He said he had been down a well to get water, but had found it hard to get out, and had just returned, so they saw it all. It is a common rule with primitive people not to waken a sleeper, because his soul is away and might not have time to get back. So, if the man wakened without his soul, he would fall sick. If it is absolutely necessary to rouse a sleeper, it must be done very gradually, to allow the soul time to return. A Fijian in Matuku, suddenly wakened from a nap by somebody treading on his foot, has been heard bawling after his soul and imploring it to return. He had just been dreaming that he was far away in Tonga, and great was his alarm on suddenly wakening to find his body in Matuku. Death stared him in the face, unless his soul could be induced to speed at once across the sea and reanimate its deserted tenement. The man, 
would probably have died of fright if a missionary had not been at hand to allay his terror. Still more dangerous is it in the opinion of primitive man to move a sleeper or alter his appearance. For if this were done, the soul, on its return, might not be able to find or recognize its body, and so the person would die. The Menankabowers deem it highly improper to blacken or dirty the face of a sleeper, lest the absent soul should shrink from re-entering a body thus disfigured. Patini Malays fancy that if a person's face be painted while he sleeps, the soul which has gone out of him will not recognize him, and he will sleep until his face is washed. In Bombay, it is thought equivalent to murder to change the aspect of a sleeper, as by painting his face in fantastic colors or giving mustaches to a sleeping woman. For when the soul returns, it will not know its own body, and the person will die. But in order that a man's soul should quit his body, it is not necessary that he should be asleep. It may quit him in his waking hours, and then sickness, insanity, or death will be the result. Thus a man of the Wurundjeri tribe in Australia lay at his last gasp because his spirit had departed from him. A medicine man went in pursuit and caught the spirit by the middle, just as it was about to plunge into the sunset glow, which is the light cast by the souls of the dead as they pass in and out of the underworld, where the sun goes to rest. Having captured the vagrant spirit, the doctor brought it back under his opossum rug, laid himself down on the dying man, and put the soul back into him, so that after a time he revived. The Karens of Burma are perpetually anxious about their souls, lest these should go roving from their bodies, leaving the owners to die. When a man has reason to fear that his soul is about to take this fatal step, a ceremony is performed to retain or recall it, in which the whole family must take part. A meal is prepared consisting of a cock and hen, a special kind of rice, and a bunch of bananas. When the head of the family takes the bowl, which is used to skim rice, and knocking with it thrice on the top of the house ladder, says, Prue, come back, soul, do not tarry outside. If it rains, you will be wet. If the sun shines, you will be hot. The gnats will sting you. The leeches will bite you. The tigers will devour you. The thunder will crush you. Pro, come back, soul. Here it will be well with you. You shall want for nothing. Come and eat under shelter from the wind and the storm. After that, the family partakes of the meal, and the ceremony ends with everybody tying their right wrist with a string which has been charmed by a sorcerer. Similarly, the Lolos of southwestern China believe that the soul leaves the body in chronic illness. In that case, they read a sort of elaborate litany, calling on the soul by name and beseeching it to return from the hills, the vales, the rivers, the forests, the fields, or from wherever it may be staying. At the same time, cups of water, wine, and rice are set at the door for the refreshment of the wary wandering spirit. When the ceremony is over, they tie a red cord round the arm of the sick man to tether the soul, and this cord is worn by him until it decays and drops off. Some of the Congo tribes believe that when a man is ill, his soul has left his body and is wandering at large. The aid of the sorcerer is then called in to capture the vagrant spirit and restore it to the invalid. Generally, the physician declares that he has successfully chased the soul into the branch of a tree. The whole town thereupon turns out and accompanies the doctor to the tree, where the strongest men are deputed to break off the branch in which the soul of the sick man is supposed to be lodged. This they do and carry the branch back to the town, insinuating by their gestures that the burden is heavy and hard to bear. When the branch has been brought to the sick man's hut, he is placed in an upright position by its side, and the sorcerer performs the enchantments by which the soul is believed to be restored to its owner. Pining, sickness, great fright, and death are ascribed by the Pataks of Sumatra to the absence of the soul from the body. At first, they try to beckon the wanderer back and to lure him like a fowl by strewing rice, when the following form of words is commonly repeated. Come back, O soul, whether thou art lingering in the wood, or on the hills, or in the dale. See, I call thee with Toemba Bras, with an egg of the fowl, Raja Mohila, with the eleven healing leaves. Detain it not, let it come straight here. Detain it not, neither in the wood, nor on the hill, nor in the dale. That may not be, O oh, come straight home. Once when a popular traveler was leaving a Cayenne village, the mothers, fearing that their children's souls might follow him on his journey, brought him the boards on which they carry their infants and begged him to pray that the souls of the little ones would return to the familiar boards and not go away with him into the far country. 
to each board was fastened a looped string for the purpose of tethering the vagrant spirits, and through the loop each baby was made to pass a chubby finger to make sure that its tiny soul would not wander away. In an Indian story, a king conveys his soul into the dead body of a Brahmin, and a hunchback conveys his soul into the deserted body of the king. The hunchback is now king, and the king is a Brahmin. However, the hunchback is induced to show his skill by transferring his soul to the dead body of a parrot, and the king seizes the opportunity to regain possession of his own body. A tale of the same type, with variations of detail, reappears among the Malays. A king has incautiously transferred his soul to an ape, upon which the vizier adroitly inserts his own soul into the king's body, and so takes possession of the queen and the kingdom, while the true king languishes at court in the outward semblance of an ape. But one day, the false king, who played for high stakes, was watching a combat of rams, and it happened that the animal on which he had laid his money fell down dead. All efforts to restore animation proved unavailing, till the false king, with the instinct of a true sportsman, transferred his own soul to the body of the deceased ram, and thus renewed the fray. The real king, in the body of the ape, saw his chance, and with great presence of mind darted back into his own body, which the vizier had rashly vacated. So he came to his own again, and the usurper in the ram's body met with the fate he richly deserved. Similarly, the Greeks told how the soul of Hermotimus of Clazomene used to quit his body and roam far and wide, bringing back intelligence of what he had seen on his rambles to his friends at home. Until one day, when his spirit was abroad, his enemies contrived to seize his deserted body and committed it to the flames. The departure of the soul is not always voluntary. It may be extracted from the body against its will by ghosts, demons, or sorcerers. Hence, when a funeral is passing the house, the Karens tie their children with a special kind of string to a particular part of the house, lest the souls of the children should leave their bodies and go into the corpse, which is passing. The children are kept tied in this way until the corpse is out of sight, and after the corpse has been laid in the grave, but before the earth has been shoveled in, the mortars and friends range themselves round the grave, each with a bamboo split lengthwise in one hand and a little stick in the other. Each man thrusts his bamboo into the grave, and drawing the stick along the groove of the bamboo, points out to his soul that in this way it may easily climb up out of the tomb. While the earth is being shoveled in, the bamboos are kept out of the way, lest the soul should be in them, and so should be inadvertently buried with the earth as it is being thrown into the grave. And when the people leave the spot, they carry away the bamboos, begging their souls to come with them. Further, on returning from the grave, each Karen provides himself with three little hooks made of branches of trees, and calling his spirit to follow him. At short intervals, as he returns, he makes a motion as if hooking it, and then thrusts the hook into the ground. This is done to prevent the soul of the living from staying behind with the soul of the dead. When the Carol Batoks have buried somebody and are filling in the grave, a sorceress runs about beating the air with a stick. This she does in order to drive away the souls of the survivors, for if one of these souls happens to slip into the grave and be covered up with earth, its owner would die. And Uea one of the loyalty islands, the souls of the dead seem to have been credited with the power of stealing the souls of the living. For when a man was sick, the soul doctor would go with a large troop of men and women to the graveyard. Here the men played on flutes, and the women whistled softly to lure the soul home. After this had gone on for some time, they formed in procession and moved homewards, the flutes playing and the women whistling all the way while they led back the wandering soul and drove it gently along with open palms. On entering the patient's dwelling, they commanded the soul in a loud voice to enter his body. Often the abduction of a man's soul is set down to demons. Thus fits and convulsions are generally ascribed by the Chinese to the agency of certain mischievous spirits who love to draw men's souls out of their bodies. At Amoy, the spirits who serve babies and children in this way rejoice in the high-sounding titles of celestial agencies bestriding galloping horses and literary graduates residing halfway up in the sky. When an infant is writhing in convulsions, the frightened mother hastens to the roof of the house and waving about a bamboo pole to which one of the child's garments is attached, cries out several times, my child, so-and-so, come back, return home. Meantime, another inmate of the house bangs away at a gong in the hope of attracting the attention of the strayed soul, which is supposed to recognize the familiar garment and to slip into it. 
the garment containing the soul is then placed on or beside the child. And if the child does not die, recovery is sure to follow sooner or later. Similarly, some Indians catch a man's lost soul in his boots and restore it to his body by putting his feet into them. In the Moluccas, when a man is unwell, it is thought that some devil has carried away his soul to the tree, mountain, or hill where he, the devil, resides. A sorcerer having pointed out the devil's abode, the friends of the patient carry thither cooked rice, fruit, fish, raw eggs, a hen, a chicken, a silken robe, gold armlets, and so forth. Having set out the food in order they pray, saying, We come to offer to you, O devil, this offering of food, clothes, gold, and so on. Take it and release the soul of the patient for whom we pray. Let it return to his body, and he who now is sick shall be made whole. Then they eat a little, and let the hen loose as a ransom for the soul of the patient. Also, they put down the raw eggs, but the silken robe, the gold, and the armlets they take home with them. As soon as they are come to the house, they place a flat bowl containing the offerings, which have been brought back at the sick man's head, and say to him, Now is your soul released, and you shall fare well, and live to gray hairs on the earth." Demons are especially feared by persons who have just entered a new house. Hence, at a housewarming among the Alfours of Manasa in Celebus, the priest performs a ceremony for the purpose of restoring their souls to the inmates. He hangs up a bag at the place of sacrifice and then goes through a list of the gods. There are so many of them that this takes him the whole night through without stopping. In the morning, he offers the gods an egg and some rice. By this time, the souls of the household are supposed to be gathered in the bag. So the priest takes the bag and holding it on the head of the master of the house says, Here, you have your soul. Go, soul. Tomorrow away again. He then does the same, saying the same words to the housewife and all the other members of the family. Amongst the same Alfours, one way of recovering a sick man's soul is to let down a bowl by a belt out of a window and fish for the soul till it is caught in the bowl and hauled up. And among the same people, when a priest is bringing back a sick man's soul, which he has caught in a cloth, he is preceded by a girl holding the large leaf of a certain palm over his head as an umbrella to keep him and the soul from getting wet, in case it should rain, and he is followed by a man brandishing a sword to deter other souls from any attempt at rescuing the captured spirit. Sometimes the lost soul is brought back in a visible shape. The Salish or Flathead Indians of Oregon believe that a man's soul may be separated for a time from his body without causing death and without the man being aware of his loss. It is necessary, however, that the lost soul should be soon found and restored to its owner, or he will die. The name of the man who has lost his soul is revealed in a dream to the medicine man, who hastens to inform the sufferer of his loss. Generally, a number of men have sustained a like loss at the same time. All their names are revealed to the medicine man, and all employ him to recover their souls. The whole night long, these soulless men go about the village from lodge to lodge, dancing and singing. Towards daybreak, they go into a separate lodge, which is closed up so as to be totally dark. A small hole is then made in the roof through which the medicine man, with a bunch of feathers, brushes in the soles in the shape of bits of bone and the like which he receives on a piece of matting. A fire is next kindled by the light of which the medicine man sorts out the souls. First, he puts aside the souls of dead people, of which there are usually several. For if he were to give the soul of a dead person to a living man, the man would die instantly. Next, he picks out the souls of all the persons present, and making them all to sit down before him, he takes the soul of each in the shape of a splinter of bone, wood, or shell, and placing it on the owner's head, pats it with many prayers and contortions, till it descends into the heart, and so resumes its proper place. Again, souls may be extracted from their bodies or detained in their wanderings, not only by ghosts and demons, but also by men, especially by sorcerers. In Fiji, if a criminal refused to confess, the chief sent for a scarf with which to catch away the soul of the rogue. At the sight, or even at the mention of the scarf, the culprit generally made a clean breast, for if he did not, the scarf would be waved over his head till his soul was caught in it, when it would be carefully folded up and nailed to the end of the chief's canoe, and for want of his soul the criminal would pine and die. The sorcerers of Danger Island used to set snares for souls. The snares were made out of stout sinnet, about fifteen to thirty feet long, with loops on either side of different sizes, to suit the different sizes of souls. For fat souls there were large loops, for thin souls there were small ones. When a man was sick against whom the sorcerers had a grudge, they set up these soul snares near his house and watched for the flight of his soul. 
If in the shape of a bird or an insect, it was caught in the snare, the man would infallibly die. In some parts of West Africa, indeed, wizards are continually setting traps to catch souls that wander from their bodies in sleep, and when they have caught one, they tie it up over the fire, and as it shrivels in the heat, the owner sickens. This is done not out of any grudge towards the sufferer, but purely as a matter of business. The wizard does not care whose soul he has captured, and will readily restore it to its owner, if only he is paid for doing so. Some sorcerers keep regular asylums for strayed souls, and anybody who has lost or mislaid his own soul can always have another one from the asylum on payment of the usual fee. No blame whatever attaches to men who keep these private asylums or set traps for passing souls. It is their profession, and in the exercise of it, they are actuated by no harsh or unkindly feelings. But there are also wretches who, from pure spite, or for the sake of lucre, set and bait traps with the deliberate purpose of catching the soul of a particular man, and in the bottom of the pot hidden by the bait are knives and sharp hooks which tear and rend the poor soul, either killing it outright or mauling it so as to impair the health of its owner when it succeeds in escaping and returning to him. Miss Kingsley knew a crewman who became very anxious about his soul because for several nights he had smelt in his dreams the savory smell of smoked crawfish seasoned with red pepper. Clearly some ill-wisher had set a trap baited with this dainty for his dream soul, intending to do him grievous bodily or rather spiritual harm, and for the next few nights great pains were taken to keep his soul from straying abroad in his sleep. In the sweltering heat of the tropical night, he lay sweating and snorting under a blanket, his nose and mouth tied up with a handkerchief to prevent the escape of his precious soul. In Hawaii, there were sorcerers who caught souls of living people, shut them up in calabashes, and gave them to people to eat. By squeezing a captured soul in their hands, they discovered the place where people had been secretly buried. Nowhere, perhaps, is the art of abducting human souls more carefully cultivated or carried to higher perfection than in the Malay Peninsula. Here, the methods by which the wizard works his will are various, and so too are his motives. Sometimes he desires to destroy an enemy, sometimes to win the love of a cold or a bashful beauty. Thus, to take an instance of the latter sort of charm, the following are the directions given for securing the soul of one whom you wish to render distraught. When the moon, just risen, looks red above the eastern horizon, go out and standing in the moonlight, with the big toe of your right foot on the big toe of your left, make a speaking trumpet of your right hand, and recite through it the following words, O oh, M, I lose my shaft, I lose it, and the moon clouds over, I lose it, and the sun is extinguished, I lose it, and the stars burn dim. But it is not the sun, moon, and stars that I shoot at. It is the stalk of the heart of that child of the congregation, so-and-so. Cluck, cluck, soul of so-and-so, come and walk with me. Come and sit with me. Come and sleep and share my pillow. Cluck, cluck, soul. Repeat this thrice, and after every repetition, blow through your hollow fist, or you may catch the soul in your turban, thus. Go out on the night of the full moon and the two succeeding nights. Sit down on an ant hill facing the moon, burn incense, and recite the following incantation. I bring you a betel leaf to chew. Dab the lime on it, Prince Ferocious. For somebody, Prince Distraction's daughter, to chew. Somebody at sunrise be distraught for love of me. Somebody at sunset be distraught for love of me. As remember your parents, remember me. As you remember your house and house ladder, remember me. When thunder rumbles, remember me. When wind whistles, remember me. When the heavens rain, remember me. When cocks crow, remember me. When the dial bird tells its tales, remember me. When you look up at the sun, remember me. When you look up at the moon, remember me. For in that selfsame moon I am there. Cluck, cluck, soul of somebody come hither to me. I do not mean to let you have my soul. Let your soul come hither to mine. Now with the end of your turban towards the moon seven times each night, go home and put it under your pillow. And if you want to wear it in the daytime, burn incense and say, It is not a turban that I carry in my girdle, but the soul of somebody. The Indians of the Nass River in British Columbia are impressed with a belief that a physician may swallow its patient's soul by mistake. A doctor who is believed to have done so is made by the other members of the faculty to stand over the patient, while one of them thrusts his fingers down the doctor's throat, another kneads him in the stomach with his knuckles, and a third slaps him on the back. If the soul is not in him, after all, and if the same process has been repeated upon all the medical men without success, it is concluded that the soul must be in the head doctor's box. 
A party of doctors, therefore, waits upon him at his house and requests him to produce his box. When he has done so and arranged its contents on a new mat, they take the votary of Esculpius and hold him up by the heels, with his head in a hole in the floor. In this position, they wash his head, and any water remaining from the ablution is taken and poured upon the sick man's head. No doubt the lost soul is in the water. Subsection 3 the soul as a shadow and a reflection. But the spiritual dangers I have enumerated are not the only ones which beset the savage. Often he regards his shadow or reflection as his soul, or at all events as a vital part of himself, and as such it is necessarily a source of danger to him. For if it is trampled upon, stuck, or stabbed, he will feel the injury, as if it were done to his person, and if it is detached from him entirely, as he believes that it may be, he will die. In the island of Wetar, there are magicians who can make a man ill by stabbing his shadow with a pike, or hacking it with his sword. After Sankara had destroyed the Buddhists in India, it is said that he journeyed to Nepal, where he had some difference of opinion with the Grand Lama. To prove his supernatural powers, he soared into the air, but as he mounted up the Grand Lama, perceiving his shadow swaying and wavering on the ground, struck his knife into it, and down fell Sankara and broke his neck. In the Banks Islands, there are some stones of a remarkably long shape, which go by the name of eating ghosts, because certain powerful and dangerous ghosts are believed to lodge in them. If a man's shadow falls on one of these stones, the ghost will draw his soul out from him, so that he will die. Such stones, therefore, are set in a house to guard it, and a messenger sent to a house by the absent owner will call out the name of the sender, lest the watchful ghost in the stone should fancy that he came with evil intent and should do him a mischief. At a funeral in China, when the lid is about to be placed on the coffin, most of the bystanders, with the exception of the nearest kin, retire a few steps or even retreat to another room, for a person's health is believed to be endangered by allowing his shadow to be enclosed in a coffin. And when the coffin is about to be lowered into the grave, most of the spectators recoil to a little distance, lest their shadows should fall into the grave and harm should thus be done to their persons." The geomancer and his assistants stand on the side of the grave which is turned away from the sun, and the grave diggers and coffin bearers attach their shadows firmly to their persons by trying to strip off cloth tightly round their waists. Nor is it human beings alone who are thus liable to be injured by means of their shadows. Animals are to some extent in the same predicament. A small snail, which frequents the neighborhood of the limestone hills in Parak, is believed to suck the blood of cattle through their shadows. Hence the beasts grow lean and sometimes die from loss of blood. The ancients suppose that in Arabia, if a hyena trod on a man's shadow, it deprived him of the power of speech and motion, and that if a dog standing on a roof in the moonlight cast a shadow on the ground and a hyena trod on it, the dog would fall down as if dragged with rope. Clearly, in these cases, the shadow, if not equivalent to the soul, is at least regarded as a living part of the man or the animal, so that injury done to the shadow is felt by the person or animal, as if it were done to his body. Conversely, if the shadow is a vital part of a man or an animal, it may under certain circumstances be as hazardous to be touched by it as it would be to come into contact with the person or animal. Hence, the savage makes it a rule to shun the shadow of certain persons whom for various reasons he regards as sources of dangerous influence. Amongst the dangerous classes, he commonly ranks mourners and women in general, but especially his mother-in-law. The shoe swap Indians think that the shadow of a mourner falling upon a person would make him sick. Amongst the Kurnai of Victoria, novices at initiation were cautioned not to let a woman's shadow fall across them, as this would make them thin, lazy, and stupid. An Australian native is said to have once nearly died of fright because the shadow of his mother-in-law fell on his legs as he lay asleep under a tree. The awe and dread with which the untutored savage contemplates his mother-in-law are amongst the most familiar facts of anthropology. In the Yuin tribes of New South Wales, the rule which forbade a man to hold any communication with his wife's mother was very strict. He might not look at her or even in her direction. It was a ground of divorce if his shadow happened to fall on his mother-in-law. In that case, he had to leave his wife and to return to her parents. 
in New Britain, the native imagination fails to conceive the extent and nature of the calamities which would result from a man's accidentally speaking to his wife's mother. Suicide of one or both would probably be the only course open to them. The most solemn form of oath a New Britain can take is, Sir, if I am not telling the truth, I hope I may shake hands with my mother-in-law, where the shadow is regarded as so intimately bound up with the life of the man that its loss entails debility or death. It is natural to expect that its diminution should be regarded with solicitude and apprehension, as betokening a corresponding decrease in the vital energy of its owner." In Amboina and Ulias, two islands near the equator, where necessarily there is little or no shadow cast at noon, the people make it a rule not to go out of the house at midday, because they fancy that by doing so a man may lose the shadow of his soul. The Mangians tell a mighty warrior, Tukatawa, whose strength waxed and waned with the length of his shadow. In the morning, when his shadow fell longest, his strength was greatest. But as the shadow shortened towards noon, his strength ebbed with it till exactly at noon it reached its lowest point. Then, as the shadow stretched out in the afternoon, his strength returned. A certain hero discovered the secret of Tukatawa's strength and slew him at noon. The savage Basisis of the Malay Peninsula fear to bury their dead at noon, because they fancy that the shortness of their shadows at that hour would sympathetically shorten their own lives. Nowhere, perhaps, does the equivalence of the shadow to the life or soul come out more clearly than in some customs practiced to this day in southeastern Europe. In modern Greece, when the foundation of a new building is being laid, it is the custom to kill a cock, a ram, or a lamb, and to let its blood flow on the foundation stone under which the animal is afterwards buried. The object of the sacrifice is to give strength and stability to the building. But sometimes, instead of killing an animal, the builder entices a man to the foundation stone, secretly measures his body, or a part of it, or his shadow, and buries the measure under the foundation stone. Or he lays the foundation stone upon the man's shadow. It is believed that the man will die within the year. The Romanians of Transylvania think that he whose shadow is thus immured will die within 40 days. So persons passing by a building, which is in course of erection, may hear a warning cry, Beware lest they take thy shadow. Not long ago, there were still shadow traders whose business it was to provide architects with the shadows necessary for securing their walls. In these cases, the measure of the shadow is looked on as equivalent to the shadow itself, and to bury it is to bury the life or soul of the man who, deprived of it, must die. Thus, the custom is a substitute for the old practice of immuring a living person in the walls or crushing him under the foundation stone of a new building in order to give strength and durability to the structure, or more definitely, in order that the angry ghost may haunt the place and guard it against the intrusion of enemies. As some peoples believe a man's soul to be in his shadow, so other or the same peoples believe it to be in his reflection in water or a mirror. Thus the Andamanes do not regard their shadows, but their reflections in any mirror as their souls. When the Matumatu of New Guinea first saw their likenesses in a looking glass, they thought that their reflection were their souls. In New Caledonia, the old men are of opinion that a person's reflection in water or a mirror is his soul. But the younger men, taught by the Catholic priests, maintain that it is a reflection and nothing more, just like the reflection of palm trees in the water. The reflection soul, being external to the man, is exposed to much the same dangers as the shadow soul. The Zulus will not look into a dark pool, because they think there is a beast in it, which will take away their reflections, so that they die. The Basutos say that crocodiles have the power of thus killing a man by dragging his reflection under water. When one of them dies suddenly, and from no apparent cause, his relatives will allege that a crocodile must have taken his shadow some time when he crossed a stream. In Saddle Island, Melanesia, there is a pool into which, if anyone looks, he dies. The malignant spirit takes hold upon his life by means of his reflection on the water. We can now understand why it was a maxim, both in ancient India and ancient Greece, not to look at one's reflection in water, and why the Greeks regarded it as an omen of death if a man dreamed of seeing himself so reflected. They feared that the water spirits would drag the person's reflection or soul under water, leaving him soulless to perish. This was probably the origin of the classical story of the beautiful Narcissus, who languished and died through seeing his reflection in the water. 
Further, we can now explain the widespread custom of covering up mirrors or turning them to the wall after a death has taken place in the house. It is feared that the soul, projected out of the person in the shape of his reflection in the mirror, may be carried off by the ghost of the departed, which is commonly supposed to linger about the house till the burial. The custom is thus exactly parallel to the Aru custom of not sleeping in a house after a death for fear that the soul, projected out of the body in a dream, may meet the ghost and be carried off by it. The reason why sick people should not see themselves in a mirror and why the mirror in a sick room is therefore covered up is also plain. In time of sickness, when the soul might take flight so easily, it is particularly dangerous to project it out of the body by means of the reflection in a mirror. The rule is therefore precisely parallel to the rule observed by some peoples of not allowing sick people to sleep, for in sleep the soul is projected out of the body, and there is always a risk that it may not return. As with shadows and reflections, so with portraits, they are often believed to contain the soul of the person portrayed. People who hold this belief are naturally loath to have their likeness taken, for if the portrait is the soul, or at least a vital part of the person portrayed, whoever possesses the portrait will be able to exercise a fatal influence over the original of it. Thus, the Eskimo of Bering Strait believe that persons dealing in witchcraft have the power of stealing a person's shade, so that without it he will pine away and die. Once at a village on the lower Yukon River, an explorer had set up his camera to get a picture of the people as they were moving about among their houses. While he was focusing the instrument, the headman of the village came up and insisted on peeping under the cloth. Being allowed to do so, he gazed intently for a minute at the moving figures on the ground glass, then suddenly withdrew his head and bawled at the top of his voice to the people, "'He has all of your shades in this box!' A panic ensued among the group, and in an instant they disappeared helter-skelter into their houses. The Tepehuanes of Mexico stood in mortal terror of the camera, and five days' persuasion was necessary to induce them to pose for it. When at last they consented, they looked like criminals about to be executed. They believed that by photographing people, the artist could carry off their souls and devour them at his leisure moments. They said that when the pictures reached his country, they would die or some other evil would befall them. When Dr. Katat and some companions were exploring the Bara country on the west coast of Madagascar, the people suddenly became hostile. The day before the travelers, not without difficulty, had photographed the royal family and now found themselves accused of taking the souls of the natives for the purpose of selling them when they returned to France. Denial was vain. In compliance with the custom of the country, they were obliged to catch the souls, which were then put into a basket and ordered by Dr. Katat to return to their respective owners. Some villagers in Sikkim portrayed a lively horror and hid away whenever the lens of a camera, or the evil eye of the box, as they called it, was turned on them. They thought it took away their souls with their pictures, and so put it in the power of the owner of the pictures to cast spells on them, and they alleged that a photograph of the scenery blighted the landscape. Until the reign of the late king of Siam, no Siamese coins were ever stamped with the image of the king, for at that time there was a strong prejudice against the making of portraits in any medium. Europeans who travel into the jungle have, even at the present time, only to point a camera at a crowd to produce its instant dispersion. When a copy of the face of a person is made and taken away from him, a portion of his life goes with the picture. Unless the sovereign had been blessed with the years of a Methuselah, he could scarcely have permitted his life to be distributed in small pieces together with the coins of the realm. Beliefs of the same sort still linger in various parts of Europe. Not very many years ago, some old women in the Greek island of Carpathus were very angry at having their likeness drawn, thinking that in consequence they would pine and die. There are persons in the west of Scotland who refuse to have their likenesses taken lest it prove unlucky, and give as instances the cases of several of their friends who never had a day's health after being photographed. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. We will be back in two weeks with our next installment. In the meantime, you can catch up with our other pod, Midwest Covencast. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on our Patreon to gain access to additional content and exclusive coven merch. You can even join our coven by following us on social media at Midwest Covencast on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and at Midwest Coven on Twitter. You can also keep up with us on our website, MidwestCovenCast.com. Until next time, Coven, blessed be.